Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to Calvary Chapel in the name of our Lord. And just rejoice anew in the blessings of God, how good God is. And what a blessing it is to be able to gather with you today and open our hearts to the Lord to allow the Spirit of God to work in our lives. Let's turn to page 110. Let's stand together as we sing once for all. Glorious, glorious truth. Jesus has paid the price for our sins once and for all. He's opened the door to heaven once and for all. What a glorious work of our Savior. Free from the law, oh, happy condition. Jesus has bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall. Grace hath redeemed us once for all. Once for all, oh, sinner, receive it. Once for all, oh, brother, believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Now are we free, there's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. Come unto me, oh, here is we call. Come and he saves us once for all. Once for all. remain standing for prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for that great redemption that you accomplished for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross, that you bore our sin. Lord, that you have cleansed us with your precious blood. We rejoice today, Lord, and your great salvation. And we thank you, Lord, that you've gathered us together this morning. We pray your hand of blessing to be upon us. We pray, Lord, that you would fill Pastor Chuck with your word. Lord, that your word would come to us in power today. We pray, Lord, that you would bless all the activity that takes place on these grounds today. And Father, we pray for your people all over the world. Lord, we pray your blessing upon your people. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. You can be seated. Yeah. 
Bless the Lord of my soul. Bless the Lord my soul and all that is within me. Bless His holy So we turn in our Bibles now to the 103rd Psalm. I'll read the first, the odd numbered verses, and Pastor Brian will lead you in the reading of the even numbered verses. Shall we stand as we read God's Word? We just sang the first verse Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide and neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, 
that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his host, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray. Father, we have gathered this day to praise you for your goodness, your mercy, and the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, how grateful we are for all that you have provided for us as your children, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the open door whereby we can come and fellowship with you. Lord, we ask that today you would speak to us through the word. May our hearts be open to receive, our ears open to hear. Challenge us, Lord, to a life of full commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. We're moving through the Bible. This week it's Leviticus chapters 15 through 17. And we'll be studying these chapters tonight. So we would encourage you to read them over. And then join with us this evening at 7 o'clock as we study through the Bible. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 16th chapter of Leviticus. The first couple of verses. And the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they had offered before the Lord and they died. And the Lord said to Moses, speak unto Aaron your brother that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. There is a hint here that the reason why the two sons of Aaron died when they offered the strange fire is that they perhaps intruded into the Holy of Holies. The Lord instructed Aaron, don't just come in here any time. In fact, God set one day out of the year in which Aaron, the high priest, could enter. No one else was to enter the Holy of Holies except for the high priest, and that on only one day of the year and on that day twice in that day. It was a special day. It was called the Day of Atonement or today it is known as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It is the day in which the high priest would make the atonement for the sins of the nation and offer the sacrifices before God there at the mercy seat which was above the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Paul, in writing to the Colossians concerning these Old Testament holy days and Yom Kippur was one of the holiest of the days, he said, Jesus has blotted out the written ordinances that were against us which were contrary to us. He took them out of the way as he nailed them to his cross. And in so doing, he spoiled the principalities and powers, and he made an open display of his victory as he triumphed over them through the cross. Let, therefore, no man judge you in respect to meat or in drink, or in respect to a holy day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which were all shadows of things to come, the substance is of Jesus. So Paul is saying to the Colossians, these holy days, Yom Kippur, and the Passover, and the Sabbath days, and all were a foreshadowing 
of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the substance. These were only shadows. The real substance is Jesus. The real substance of these days is found in Jesus. These sacrifices, the Day of Atonement, was all pointing ahead to Jesus. Why a sacrifice? The Bible declares that the penalty of sin is death. Man's sin requires that man should die. But God provided a way whereby a man did not have to die for his sin. And that was by allowing an animal to become a substitute for the man. So when you had sinned, you would bring an animal to the priest. You would place your hand upon the head of the animal and confess your sins. Thus, in a figurative sense, the sin was transferred from you onto the animal. And as the sin was transferred onto the animal, the animal would then be slain, and the priest would take the blood and he would put it upon the horns of the altar and pour the remainder around the base of the altar, and thus would be a covering for your sin. And with the covering for your sin, you would now be free to fellowship with God. But the animal became the substitute. But once a year, one day out of the year, the high priest would go into the most holy place where was represented the presence of God, the glory of God, the Shekinah dwelt there in the Holy of Holies. And he would enter in to make atonement for the sins of the nation. On this day, the priest would do all, the high priest would do all of the work himself. He would offer each sacrifice. Now, daily, through the years, the other priest would be offering the sacrifices. But on Yom Kippur, the high priest alone would slay, first of all, the bullock for his own sin. And he would take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the mercy seat there in the presence of God. And then he would return outside and they would have the two goats and the goat would be selected for the sin sacrifice. He would slay it and take the blood of that goat into the uh, mercy seat. But the high priest acted alone. And of course, it speaks to us of how that Jesus accomplished the work of our redemption alone. The Bible tells us that they all forsook him and fled. The prophecy was fulfilled. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed alone. The disciples were nearby, but they were sleeping. Jesus stood alone before the high priest and before Pilate to be judged. Jesus alone bore our sins upon the cross. Just as the high priest did the work alone, so Jesus alone accomplished the work of our redemption. The high priest took off the beautiful robes of the high priest, and he put on the common linen robes of the common priest. This speaks to us of how Jesus laid aside his glory in order that he might become a man, in order that as a man he might make the sacrifice for our sins. The Bible tells us that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death 
but God has crowned him with glory and with honor. We are told that he was with God. He did not think it was something to be grasped, to be equal with God. And yet he humbled himself. And he came in the form of a man and was obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. <coughs> Excuse me. We are told that in this he laid aside his glory in order that he might bear our sins. First, as we mentioned, the high priest would offer a bullock for his own sins and that of his family. There is nothing with Jesus that is a sequel to this because Jesus was without sin. He had no need of offering a sin offering for himself. But then after having offered the blood of the bull for his own sin, he would come out and there were two goats that were there before him. One was to be slain as the sacrifice for the sins and the other was to be released in the wilderness, pointing out the twofold work of Jesus. Jesus not only has provided the sacrifice for your sins, but even as the goat was released in the wilderness and disappeared forever, so Jesus has put away your sins. As we read in the psalm this morning, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. Aren't you glad that he said, as far as the east is from the west, rather than saying, as far as the north is from the south? We know how far the north is from the south. You can travel north only so far till you get to the North Pole. The moment you get to the North Pole, you are now traveling south. And you can travel south only so far until you get to the South Pole, and then you're traveling north. But you can take off today traveling east, and you can travel east the rest of your life. You can take off today traveling west, and you'll travel west the rest of your life as far as the east is from the west. That's how far he has separated our sins from us. Now, these two goats would be brought to the priest. And he had two lots. They were either made of wood or stone or metal, but upon them was inscribed on the one lot the word Lashim the Hebrew word for the name. On the other was inscribed La Zaziel, which is the scapegoat. He then put the two lots in a vessel, which was called the cowpea, and the goats were standing there facing the west. The priest came and as the goat stood before him, one on the right hand, the other on the left, the cowpea was shaken, and the priest would put both hands in and with each hand draw a lot. The lot that was in his right hand would be upon the goat that was on his right hand. The lot in his left hand would be upon the goat in his left hand. As his hand was open, and if the lot said Lashim, that goat was to be slain as the sacrifice for the sins of the people. The lot that said Azazel was determined that that goat was the one that would be released in the wilderness, signifying the removal of their sins. And so as the Lashim goat was then killed, the priest would take the blood into the Holy of Holies, put it on the mercy seat, 
to make a covering for the sins of the people. The other goat was led by a priest who when they left the temple precincts, there would be several priests that would go together leading the goat. One would ultimately lead him far into the wilderness. And at strategic points on mountaintops, a priest would stand as the others would go and on each mountaintop, a priest would stand. So that when the one priest leading the goat got out into the wilderness a good distance, he would release the goat and shoo it away. And when the goat ran over the hill and disappeared, he would turn and signal to the priest on the mountaintop who would signal to the next priest who would signal to the next who would signal finally to the priest who was standing on the Mount of Olives. And when the priests on the Mount of Olives saw the signal that signified that the goat had disappeared, he would turn and he would signal to the high priest who was standing there in the door of the temple. And when the high priest received the signal, he would say to the people, your sins are removed. What a wonderful moment of elation and joy that was. The people would break forth in singing, shouts of joy, hallelujahs unto God, because their sins have been removed. The goats actually spoke of the twofold work of Jesus, the forgiveness of our sins, but the removing, the putting away of our sins. At the baptismal services, as I am standing there in the water with those that are to be baptized, I will often say to them, we are now going to bury all of the past. All of the sins have been forgiven. We're going to bury that old life that was governed by sin. And so often I'll see tears form and run down their cheeks. And I'll see them mouth the words, oh, praise the Lord, or thank God. And it's a beautiful emotional experience to realize that our sins have been removed, forgiven. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. For the people it signified that now the door was open where they could come and fellowship with God. You see, this is why God made man in the first place. He made man for fellowship. God desired and longs for a meaningful relationship with his creation. And so he created you for that purpose. He designed you for that purpose. And in order that you might have this meaningful relationship, he gave to you a free will that you can choose to fellowship with God or you can choose not to fellowship. You can choose to live a life of righteousness in fellowship with God or you can choose to live a life of sin separated from God. So that when you make that choice to fellowship with God, it's a meaningful choice. It's a meaningful fellowship. But our sins have separated us from God. God created Adam for fellowship. He enjoyed fellowship with God until the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit. When sin entered, his fellowship with God was broken. The prophet Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short, that he cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. 
but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Not that he cannot, he will not. People often try to understand the cry of Jesus on the cross when he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was actually quoting from Psalm 22. And in that psalm, the answer is given. In verse 3, it said, For thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of your people Israel. It is because of the holiness of God that Jesus was forsaken on the cross because the Bible tells us that there on the cross, God laid on him the iniquities of us all. Jesus bore every sin collectively that man has committed when he died on the cross for us. This is why in the garden he was, as it would seem, seeking to avoid the cross. As he prayed in great agony, his sweat turning as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground, he prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. The cup that he was referring to was the cross. What was the bitterness that he was seeking to avoid? The bitterness of being separated from his father, which was necessary when he took upon himself our sins. Paul wrote to the Galatians, and God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. And as he bore your sin, he bore the consequences, the separation from God. Hence the cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But because he was willing to take your sin, you never need to cry that plaintive cry, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? The inevitable consequence of sin is separation from God. John wrote, if we say that we have fellowship with God and we are walking in darkness, we are lying, we don't know the truth. But if we will walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other as the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Fellowship means oneness. It means union. You can have oneness with God. You can have union with God. But God cannot have union with sin. God cannot be one with sin. Therefore, in order for us to have fellowship with God, the sin has to be taken care of and that's exactly what Jesus did our great high priest who entered into heaven not into the earthly tabernacle or temple into the holy of holies built with man's hands but into heaven itself listen to what the writer to Hebrews said but Christ has become a high priest of good things by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, one that was not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean would sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works unto a living God. For when Moses had spoken every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats 
with water and the scarlet wool and the hyssop. And he sprinkled both the book and all of the people. And he said, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all of the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things by the law were purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there was no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter into the holy places made with hands, which were only a figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Our great high priest, Jesus Christ, not with the blood of animals, with his own blood, entered into the presence of the Father in heaven, bringing the covering, the atonement, the forgiveness, and the putting away of our sin. No doubt, when the priest signaled to the people, your sins are removed, that there was a moment of emotion, of thrill, realizing the guilt is gone. I'm no longer guilty before God. I've been cleansed from my guilt. That same emotion when we realize what Jesus has done for us in removing from us the guilt of sin by our believing and trusting in him. Opening the door for us to come in and fellowship with God. It is so good to know that our great high priest has entered into heaven for us and has appeared before God in the mercy seat. And thus, we can fulfill the basic purpose of our existence we can fellowship with the only true and living God, the God who created our universe. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession of faith. For we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Under the old economy, God could only be approached by the high priest and that only one day in the year, and that only after many sacrifices. Common man could not approach the holy God. But when Jesus was crucified, you remember the testimony, the veil of the temple, that is, that veil that separated man from the presence of God, which only the high priest could pass through. It was torn from the top to the bottom, Jesus Christ our Lord opened up the way, the way for you and for me to come to God. When he died on the cross, he redeemed all the lost, and he prepared a road that leads to his abode. It's a road that's marked by blood, but it leads us home to God. What a thrill, what a blessing to realize that Jesus atoned for my sin. But not only that, he put my sin away, never to be remembered again against me. The slate is clean. I've been washed through the blood of Jesus Christ. I've been cleansed. 
from all guilt, all sin. What a joy. What a relief to realize I'm free. Free from the power of sin. Free to live in fellowship with my creator. What a blessing. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had done its dirty work. It left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Let's pray. Father, how grateful we are for Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who has entered into heaven for us and who has opened the door for us to follow him right into your presence who has given to us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And we've come to know you as a loving, kind, gracious Father in heaven who loves his children and loves to just fellowship with them. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity of fellowshipping with you today. And now, Lord, we do pray that if there are those here today who do not know Jesus as their Redeemer, who are still bound with sin and iniquity in their lives, that they'll come to know this day the glorious freedom freedom from sin, knowing that you have put away our guilt and separated us from our past and made us new creatures in Christ Jesus. Oh Lord, open our hearts now to receive your love, your forgiveness, and your fullness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are here at the front of the church this morning. As soon as we are dismissed, if you would like to know that glorious joy of having your sins forgiven, being freed from the power of sin, having your sins removed and put away. We would encourage you to come on down and let them pray with you and pray for you. You can go out of here today cleansed from all your sin. For the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sin. You can go away from here free from guilt. That heavy load of guilt can be lifted. You can be set free. You can go away from here today in the joy of fellowshipping with God, knowing his presence with you, enjoying that presence of God in your life. Jesus made the way for this to be possible. And so if your desire is to come and to be cleansed, we would encourage you to do so. Or if you are just in need of prayer for any particular need, maybe you're going to have an operation this week, you're concerned. Maybe you're facing a particularly difficult time, you're concerned. The Bible tells us to cast all of our cares on him because he cares for you. And he tells us to bear one another's burdens. And so the pastors are here to bear your burdens today, to pray with you, and to help you discover the grace of God and the goodness of God in your life, meeting your particular need. So don't be in a hurry to leave, but first meet with God so that as you go, you will go with God. 
and experience the joy of his presence in your life. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep